Hello, welcome. My name is Ellen Mueller. I'm the director of the MFA program at Minneapolis College of Art and Design. And before I introduce our speakers for this event, I want to respectfully acknowledge that the land we are occupying in Minneapolis is unceded territory, the ancestral homelands of the Dakota people. Gathering here, we pay our respects to the elders, both past and present. We acknowledge the grave harm that colonialism has brought to these lands, in particular, the erasure of both indigenous and African identities, not only under slavery, but by racist laws that have segregated all people. We honor those who have lived and do live now at these intersections of identity and experience. And I'm gonna go through a little bit of nuts and bolts for everyone about the webinar tonight. Um, your audio and video will be muted during this webinar, and please feel free to use our questions box. This is our main place for communications. You can um, state questions for the panelists or leave commentary in there, and I'll be reading that throughout the event. Um, we will select questions from those that are submitted for the panelists at the end, so be taking notes, jot down your thoughts. Um, that's what really makes the Q&A at the end a lot of fun. Um, also, a recording of this webinar will be made available. We'll get those put together and posted online in the next week or so, and we'll send it out to everybody who's registered. Um, the full agenda for tonight is posted online at the link pictured here. You can read all about all of our presenters, both tonight and in the past three nights. Also, um, you'll notice in the navigation area that there is a handout available. And this will have really great crowdsourced uh, materials on there, including a reading list uh, and a shared assignments folder. And uh, I encourage you all to download that and use it sort of as your guide for the evening. Um, if you experience any technical difficulties throughout the webinar, feel free to email us at av underscore support at mcad.edu and we'll do our best to quickly help you. Uh, and finally, this event is sponsored by the MCAD MFA program. And if you're curious about that, feel free to check us out. We're online at mcad-mfa.com. Also, when we originally planned this event, we were going to do it in person. And we had this exciting tour planned with um, the Minnesota Humanities, um, center and it's this program called Learning from Place Vidote and it's fantastic. Um, and so there's two more of these events this summer, one on August 9th and one September 12th. As you can see, we just received word on the first day of our conference that they are full, which is great news because it's really great programming. Um, but you can get on their wait list. So I wanted to share that with all of you today in case any of you are within driving distance of the Twin Cities feel free to get yourself on that wait list. You never know, a spot might open up this summer. And if you don't get to go, um, they are gonna continue doing this next summer. So just Google learning from place Bedote and it will come up. All right. And also an event like this doesn't come together with just one person. We've had so much amazing support from um, both our technical and administrative support areas. So I'd like to name names here. Thank you, Kylie Van Note, Seth Dalside, Cleo Young, Lauren Zimich, and Nikki Motocolum. Um, these are really fantastic people who helped pull this event together. All right, and um, I'd like to uh, welcome you all and thank you for sticking with us through our various reschedulings. Um, the idea for this conference came from recognition that many programs in higher education are moving towards increasing community engagement and experiential learning, and often that has place-based themes. Um, and then further, as this spring has progressed, we've seen place highlighted as we live through an ongoing pandemic, as we grapple with civil unrest following the murder of George Floyd and too many others at the hands of the police. Um, and just recently, this past week, with um, regulations handed down by ICE about our international students, and then those were rescinded. So we're seeing in countless ways this idea of place intersects with our daily lives. Um, so today, I'm very excited that we're going to hear from a variety of folks, um, artists, educators, curators, um, all of these different points of view. And I hope that everybody who's attending today will be able to take something useful away um, from our panelists. So I'd like to start off 
today with a little poll, just so we can all have a sense of each other. So Cleo, if you wouldn't mind launching that poll. Um, and this is just asking, what area of art or education do you work in or participate in? Um, so if you could uh, click your answer there, and it looks like we're about 60% done. Go ahead and enter your answer. And we're at about 75%. If you wanna get your answer in there, go ahead and do so. One or a couple more seconds. All right, Cleo, I think we can see, if you wanna show us the results. And great. Well, it looks like we don't have anyone from K through 12 tonight. 85% um, of folks are coming from higher ed. We've got 13% of people coming from community-based or nonprofit settings, and then 15% from other places, which is great. Um, so with that, um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Reagan Golden McNerney, pronouns she, her, who will be followed by Leslie Grant, pronouns she, her, and they will be presenting Sensing Place. This is Sensing Place, using vision and sound to create an embodied experience of a landscape. This talk includes two project descriptions, Ecstatic Landscapes by Reagan Golden and Sound Sight by Leslie Grant. Hi, my name is Reagan Golden McNerney, and I'm presenting on the Ecstatic Landscape project um, that I created for my color and mixed media class at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. In my work as an artist, I sense climate change in the urban forest. Um, I work primarily from a forest that is right beside my house, and I live right in the middle of the city. Um, between Minneapolis and St. Paul. And this series, Thaw, from 2017, is about the way that winter is changing in Minnesota. It's an ongoing series of digital photographs documenting temporary collages that I make of plants, paint, plastics, snow, and ice. So the focus of my work is on how to depict a changing landscape. In 2010, I started photographing the woods behind my grandmother's house as it was uh, facing um, destruction. This uh, led to a artist book called Inside Out, Picture of a Forest that I created in 2014. And in it, I cut apart the image of the forest and then showed it kind of collapsing. Um, so I'm really interested in this idea of what is inside and what is outside when you're creating a picture of a landscape. So the idea of the Ecstatic Landscape Project is to be both kind of inside and outside of a landscape, to hold these two positions simultaneously. And this project was designed to ask students to reflect on their sense of a landscape within many different frames. The frame of the page, the frame of the gallery, the frame of the viewfinder, while working both individually and collaboratively. Um, Ecstatic is a word that's derived from the ancient Greek word ecstatikos, meaning ek, to be outside, statikos, the place where you should stand. So again, being both outside and of the frame where you're supposed to be, and then also being full of emotion. So landscape as a genre of art is really defined by the function of the frame, which unifies all the parts of the place into a picture kind of marking one moment in time from the singular perspective of one artist. So in the first phase of this project, I asked students to go out and sense the weather. Um, each day I said to spend a brief time outdoors um, experiencing the weather, find a comfortable spot to sit and experience the dampness or dryness of the air as you breathe, feel the warmth of the sun or the coolness of the wind on your back, see the color and direction of the light. Then I asked students to create drawings, very small in their sketchbooks, um, based on uh, that experience um, each day for one week. They could use color pencil, soft pastel, or watercolor, and they needed to mark the date, the time, and the weather at the top of their drawing. The proportions of objects in their drawings um, needed to be accurate, 
but color choices needed to be subjective. They could use their imagination to exaggerate, replace, warp the color so that it resonated with their experience of the place. The inspirations for the drawing process was uh, Wolf Kahn's pastels on paper, Emily Mason's oil paintings, uh, George Morrison's color pencil drawings of Lake Superior, and Ronnie Horn's photograph series, uh, You Are the Weather. So after students had created their drawings, a week later they gathered together to share their drawings in small groups of three to five students. Are there any kind of color combinations um, that reappear throughout uh, the series? As a group, they needed to select like one day in particular that seemed especially strong amongst all the group members, and then use those drawings that they did on that day as the starting point for their installation. They needed to draft a plan collaboratively describing what their installation would look like, and then pick a space within MCAD to work in. Their installation needed to translate the color and atmosphere of their drawings into an ecstatic landscape. The inspiration for the um, installation process uh, really came from Sam Gilliam's um, sculptural paintings, uh, particularly Carousel Merge from 1971, which is acrylic on canvas, and was at the time on view at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, and is also in the collection of the Walker Art Center. So also another inspiration was Katarina Gross's um, painted sculptures and her Art 21 interview as well as Olafur Eliasson's piece Beauty um, and his early installations with light and mist. Students could use watercolor, acrylic, pastel, and gouache on any surface that meets the installation requirements set by the MCAD gallery staff, and the minimum dimensions could be 10 by 15 feet. The project goals were to understand how color and value work together to transform a white cube gallery space into an ecstatic landscape. Projects were evaluated based on the concepts, craft, and composition of the work. Examples. The first example here is uh, created by a group of uh, students in spring 2019. In this, they used acrylic, and soft pastel on cloth and paper with found objects and they also scanned in their initial drawings and then projected them into the space. They also used string to kind of add line work um, within the composition as well. In the next example they really got into using light gels um, to create a really intense environment. Um, they combined acrylic on canvas and clothing and found objects along with um, tape and wool uh, to create a completely immersive environment. In the last example, um, this group had a hallway space to deal with. One side was a wall and one side on the left here was glass. And so they painted the wall with acrylic paint, they painted on cloth and also on paper mache and uh, also uh, incorporated found objects and kind of netting above to really make this hallway um, an interesting landscape to navigate through. So the last phase of the project was to think about how their ecstatic landscapes could be reframed by making the documentation process into abstract photographs. So here are three examples of the resulting photographs from the installation. I think that since the um, murder of George Floyd and the protests that have changed the Twin Cities in the past couple of months, I think that the landscape here has been transformed. And to use a quote from the Reverend Al Sharpton, now is a different time and now is a different season. And I wonder how my future students will um, perceive the atmosphere of this current moment and translate that into meaningful spaces. So I want to thank all the students and staff at MCAD who make this uh, wonderful experimentation possible. Thank you. Thank you, Reagan. Um, and
Thank you to Ellen, all the staff and tech support, and all the presenters, the attendees. Um, my name is Leslie Grant, and I'm going to talk today about how listening can connect us to place and helps to locate us within our environment. Um, I am an adjunct faculty in the Media Arts uh, Department at MCAD, and I am going to present an assignment that I give to my first year students in a course called Media One. Um, so we think about how paying attention and um, really considering the sounds around us can lead to a deeper understanding and knowledge about the dynamics of our environments, such as the complexities of the natural world and the built environment, um, and the hierarchies of class, gender, race, and ability as they play out um, in lived space. And students in this project, they create a site-specific sound piece. And the assignment really aims to involve them in a listening practice, um, to learn about the world around them and their place in it, and to create a unique sound piece that communicates some of that learning back to the audience. I will briefly describe the project brief and include the conceptual and contextual background, and then I'm going to play a sound uh, piece example from one of my students. Um, so that's how this talk will go. Uh, so I present the assignment to my students as sounds for a place and ask them to create a sound piece that illuminates, alters, and or complicates the listener's perception of the site they end up choosing. The final piece is interactive so that the listener will put on headphones and use their smartphone um, and download a Google map with uh, the sound files as links they can click on. Um, so as a class, we walk around the neighborhood near MCAD and go to each site and listen to the different sound pieces as the final presentation. So students have to choose a site that's within walking distance of MCAD, and it can be an interior or exterior space. So it could be inside a store or a restaurant or outside at a bus stop in an alleyway, a park. It's very open. Uh, they visit this site to before they record anything, to spend time listening there. And I ask them to think about the past, the present, and the future of their site, to think about who they are in this place and how their identity affects their experience there and also who inhabits this space. Could be workers, commuters, passersby, um, and what can they imagine about the experience people are having in this site. Um, so then they revisit the, their site and they make uh, field recordings there. And after they've gathered these ambient sounds, they create unique sounds to layer with the field recordings. And these sounds, the idea of them is that they should help to reveal the site and give part of the students lived experience. Um, and they can use voiceover narration or they can create their own sound effects. They could have recorded dialogue or someone reading a poem or from a text. Um, and in order to start the assignment, as a class, we go on a sound walk. Um, and before we even do the walk itself, we discuss the cultural implications of walking for pleasure, who the walker is, where they walk, and when, and how this determines if the walker has comfort and safety, faces discomfort, harassment, or bodily harm. So two examples of um, different types of texts that describe these implications that I share with the class are, uh, the first is uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates' autobiographical discussion of the black male body and its physical harm in relation to the streets um, in his book, Between the World and Me. He's talking about growing up in Baltimore. And another example is Rebecca Solnit's historical and cultural study of the limitations and intimidations women face when walking in public in her book, Wanderlust. The walk itself takes about 30 to 45 minutes, and we walk slowly, quietly um, around the neighborhood near MCAD. We stop in two locations for five minutes each, and students have their eyes closed, they're silent and still, just to really get a deeper listening experience. Um, and in this way, students have a chance to practice deep listening before they choose their sites. 
As they're working on the project, uh, we also discuss the cultural implications of the way we interpret the sounds we hear and how this reflects the inequalities and stereotypes present in our society and how power plays out in terms of sound and place. Um, two examples of um, texts that we look to are Tina Talon's article, it's called A Century of Shrill, How Bias in Technology Has Hurt Women's Voices, which was published in The New Yorker. In this article, she talks about um, recording and broadcast technology and how it was optimized um, for lower frequencies, meaning male voices, and that this makes women's voices sound shrill, tinny, and affected. Another example is Jennifer Stover's The Sonic Color Line. Uh, we listened to an excerpt of a podcast where she discusses some of her ideas from the book. Um, and in her book, she argues, uh, American ideologies of white supremacy are just as dependent on what we hear, so sound, volume, musical taste, as they are on the visual. Sound and listening not only reveal the racial politics of our world, but actively produce them as well. And I'll just read a quick quote from Stover. She writes, without ever con consciously expressing the sentiment, white Americans often feel entitled to respect for their sensibilities, sensitivities, and tastes, and to their implicit, sometimes violent control over the soundscape of an ostensibly free, open, and public space. At this point, I would like to play an example um, from one of my students who I had in my Media One class in fall 2019. Their name is Synth Xie, and they chose as their site B Resale, which is a clothing um, store uh, right on Nicolette, which is near MCAD. And the piece is three minutes and 37 seconds long. All of the student pieces were about three minutes. Um, and I'd like to play the whole piece out of respect for the narrative arc and for the message that Synth is communicating. Um, so I hope you enjoy listening to this. Um, and I'd love to hear what you think later when we're having our questions. So thank you. God. Zombie in the store. Maybe it's because the fact that I have long hair and I'm wearing a chest binder. No, oh, no. no one's gonna know I'm wearing a chest binder. Wait, I will. I feel dumb now. I feel like I shouldn't be wearing this. Because everyone's going to mistake me as a girl, anyways. That's the point. I can't believe. Here's this long right now. All these dresses here remind me of prom. The only reason why my hair is this long is because my mom made me grow it out for prom. My hair used to be so short. I wanted to wear a suit to prom in the first place, but I know that she wouldn't let me. There was no way. Every time my mom would cut my hair short, she would go, You look like a boy. I don't even know what you are anymore. Or a man or a woman. And hell, that's why I thought. I feel so stressed out about. Oh, everything is sectioned off by gender here. <laughs> is that a weird thought? Is that a thought that most people have? Oh, I shouldn't get so anxious. I'm just buying clothes for myself. Alright, alright. Uh, these pants are nice. I'm not, I'm not sure if they have it in my size though. I, I should go ask, but... Well... Will the employees judge me for it? These are men's pants. I mean... That's what I want, though. God, this is so scary. Okay. I'm just gonna ask. Hey, sorry, but could you... 
to help me find these pants in my size. Sure thing, they're right over here. Oh. Oh, thank you. Oh. Uh, oh, that wasn't so bad. I don't, I don't know what I'm so afraid of. <laughs> Changing room. That's so much work. Also, just I hate stripping down in, in public, in like a public area in space. I know, I know, I know that the the the, the dressing rooms are private, but it just feels weird. It feels vulnerable. All right. Thank you, Reagan and Leslie. That was great. Uh, next, we have Robert Buck, pronouns he, him, who will be presenting Otherness, Place, and Tourism, Shared Visiting Artist and Student Experiences in Wichita, Kansas, and Wellington, New Zealand. Thank you. This presentation will explore the processes and highlights of two month-long visiting artist engagements in each other's universities and cu cultures by myself and Richard Redaway of Massey University in Wellington, New Zealand. In each case, projects on otherness, community, and collaboration were created with students and exhibited in our university galleries. Richard and myself became acquainted at an artist residency in Puebla, Mexico in 2015 and recognized overlapping interests through provocations and artworks we each made subsequent to the concurrent residencies. At a point in my video from the Las Calles Publicas project, The Public Streets, a Mexican street poster, protester gives me the finger, disrupting my tourist gaze. In this moment, I'm the other, but it is my neo-colonial Western privilege that is revealed back to the camera. In Richard's performance in Puebla, Ahora ve aquí, now we are here, with a group of young working class, mostly indigenous poblanos at a pulque bar chosen by a local artist. Richard had wearable, asymmetrical, odd forms of paper mache embedded with speakers that played various sounds he'd made then offered to the local friends in the bar. How did they flip Richard's aesthetic choices into their own choices about how to wear them or display them or what to do with them at all? Were they the hierarchies at play in our works disrupted or transformed by the possibilities of exchange? As two white male artists interested in intersubjectivity, we set about hosting each other as visiting artists with collaborative projects that might create an inclusive and experiential place of sorts with processes where everyone's contribution or voice would be as recognizable or poetic as they determined. Critical self-reflection was crucial for each of us. The projects we proposed at similarities but also differences. Each would include an exhibition in our campus galleries. Each would be a collaborative process. As inspiration, we started with Boaventura de Sousa Santos' text, Epistemologies of the South, particularly its declaration of the importance of the promotion of an ecology of knowledges combined with intercultural translation. This provided the framework on which to begin a conversation that could use artistic processes to enact collaborations that could result in sites or places of shared recognition. We structured discussions with students and other faculty around aspects of the text to inquire how artists might tackle its ideas in subject, form, and process. In Wichita, one's own and other's otherness focused on a series of actions by students in one of my classes that asked the students to focus on differences between themselves and a partner they selected and to develop a visual language around those differences. The partner could contribute or create part of the artwork if so inclined. Students in the class worked with partners on the drawing and the field reporting, recording components with the wearable sculpture and performance created by class participants without the outside partners. Shown are additional instructions to explore contrasting identities in service of creating a shared space. The collaborative drawings required the makers to be able to point to which part was theirs and which were the partners and to result in a roughly 50-50 contribution. 
This is an example of a completed collaborative drawing between a Wichita State student and their non-artist partner made out of cut paper, collage, inkjet prints, graphite, and thread, approximately 60 inches by 60 inches. Text in this work is alternately in Mandarin, Chinese, and English, an example of many differentiations between the two partners. Richard worked with students to create sculptures from recycled cardboard that would include speakers playing sound recordings made by the students and their partners. In Wichita, the sculptures were wearable, and in New Zealand, they were mostly more architectonic. The aesthetic of the collaborative cardboard sculptures was informed by improvisational semi-figurative assemblages and environments that we were familiar with, such as those by Noah Purifoy on the left and Leonard Knight on the right. And I think in these works, you can see a sense of place. They're both in the California desert, and they possess a kind of shambling improvisational quality that reflects the arid scruffiness of that landscape. But they also are resourceful, inventive, and varied qualities traditionally valuable to inhabitants of the harsh Mojave environment. In addition to creating collaborative sculptural works out of the discarded materials during Richard's visit, students and faculty participated in a panel discussion on intersubjectivity and intercultural equity. The resulting wearable works played sounds recorded by the partners as representative of each of their lives. An alarm going off for the athlete who woke up early to run, a song on the guitar, blips and tones of video games, particularly Mario Brothers, practicing a cello, recorded steps walking on campus. We had them do that at one minute each because we had um, quite a few participants. In New Zealand, rather than partnering, the focus shifted to creating a community making place where a spirit of collaboration and creativity could permeate both the space and the art. At a designated time each day, students arrived and worked on any artworks they wished. Each person ultimately had a hand in each of about 10 works created. Students made sound recordings to give the sculptures a more specific presence. We titled that one, A Social Assemblage. For sounds in A Social Assemblage, I included recordings of myself as well as street musicians and the very different sounds of both the urban environment and the ever-present local birds in New Zealand, which are significant enough that you can often even hear them over traffic. Student participants recorded themselves singing, playing music, cooking in their kitchens, speaking in languages other than English, and other noises of their lives. So in the recording I'm about to share, the student is working on a sewing machine. <laughs> So I especially liked that she recorded herself humming while doing this and that she didn't edit out the, edit out the other person running the water and talking in the background. Um, it gave it um, a sense of personality for sure and intimacy as well. Questions of place in these works. Do they create a sense of their own place in the space of the gallery? Did we interrogate the elitism and minimalism of the white cube? Did we create a place informed by voices a moment in time? Certainly the contribution of the recorded sounds lent specificity, and the end result was cacophonous for sure and multifaceted, and yet things could be picked out uh, absolutely, and you could hear those different languages and those cellos and other things that were going on. Yet I still wonder if we should have gone farther from art. Can a place be shared through its process? Can a space be created through this process, even if it's quite fantastical? There's a contradiction in that the forms are fantastic and unreal, abstract. The forms are utopic, but the process and the sonic elements are documentary reflections of realities. So perhaps we can understand these forms and their process of construction and places through the lens of Michel Foucault's heterotopias from other, of other spaces, uh, a lecture in 1967, where he said, they're quoting, there are also places which are something like counter sites, a kind of effectively enacted utopia in which the real sites, all the other real sites that can be found within the culture are simultaneously represented, contested and inverted. Places of this kind are outside of all places, even though it may be possible to indicate their location in reality. I believe that between utopias and these quite other sites, these heterotopias, 
there might be a sort of mixed joint experience. The garden is the smallest parcel of the world, and then it is the totality of the world, unquote. I rather like the idea of the garden for this, and I think that what we did is somewhat like that. It was accumulated in one space over a period of time. It sort of grew simultaneously, cultivated by many people in that one space with not very entirely re predictable results. At the reception in New Zealand, there were smaller works that were wearable, but the majority of the collaboration resulted in continuing upward and outward, works that did create a landscape of sorts. We attempted to create a place where everyone's voice is included and recognizable on their own terms because we did not dictate the content of the sound recordings or even the direction in terms of how they mani manipulated the forms. Concluding thoughts. We did not initially consider the dual projects in terms of place. The focus was inner subjectivity and identity. Although our own initial interests began from each other's sense of otherness in a specific place, and our shared desires to respect and consider otherness more broadly. Students who participated in the projects reported that their ideas of art making and inner subjectivity were enhanced from the experience. Critical self-reflection was embedded within the process for them as well as for Richard and I. In New Zealand, I was introduced to the partnership between Maori and Pakeha, the Maori term for white European heritage people, which exists formally and informally. Uniquely among countries like it, New Zealand's constitution recognizes Pakeha as guests on Maori land. And as such, the Maori permanently have representation within government, not as locals from a specific place, but as indigenous peoples whose voices listen to in official matters. I saw the presence of the Maori tradition very quickly. Upon initially entering the art department of the University in Wellington, an urban university in the city center, I was given a hungi greeting, which is a traditional greeting with hands clasped, foreheads and noses touching, initiated by Maori representatives, some were faculty and or staff, and Pakeha faculty or staff as well. It was explained to me that it was the Maori custom to greet visitors with a ceremonial welcome to the land upon entry to New Zealand. And this practice was standard because all of New Zealand was and is recognized as Maori land. I also learned that although museums in New Zealand have collections of Maori art, it is often difficult to find a lot of it on view because the art had been collected in the past in the ways we know indigenous art had typically been collected without authorization and without regard to the Maori belief that the spirit embedded within the forms dies. That's a term shared with me by a Maori artist when it is removed from its context. So many museums have sought to correct this issue by in part consulting Maori leaders about what should be returned, what should be kept and how, and what can be on view. The Maori art in on view in museums I visited was that which had been created with approval or specifically for that environment. These experiences informed my thinking as I worked with Richard and the other students in New Zealand. Ultimately, I found my learning of New Zealand's respect for and inclusion of Maori practice and tradition to be very impactful on my own understanding of inner subjectivity and inquiry into how the US and other American nations such as Brazil, Mexico, and Canada can do better. For more detailed information on the history and development of the relationship between Pakeha and Maori in New Zealand, uh, a book by Dom Dominic O'Sullivan, Beyond Biculturalism, The Politics of an Indigenous Minority, is a good start. Finally, a big thank you to Elm Muir and everyone at MCAD for including my presentation and for putting on this terrific conference. Thank you so much, Robert. That was fantastic. Um, next, we have Alex Braidwood pronouns he, him, who will be presenting Teaching Soundscape, Acoustic Ecology, and Sustainability. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for attending. Uh, I'm really excited for the premise of this conference and the discussion to follow. Uh, my presentation today is called Teaching Soundscape, Acoustic Ecology, and Sustainability. Uh, my name is Alex Braidwood. If you're interested in learning more about my work, uh, my website is listeninginstruments.com and my Instagram is listeninginstruments. So I thought I would start out by uh, introducing myself and just in giving a little bit of a description about where I come from. Um, so I'm a graphic designer and a sound artist. And my position uh, at the university involves being in the graphic design department, uh, also being faculty in the human computer interaction or HCI PhD program. Uh, and then I am also faculty at the Iowa Lakeside Lab uh, Biological Field Research Station. And so when it comes to these three things, I think about it like this, like graphic design is really about engaging people. Uh, human computer interaction is really about technology and 
Iowa Lakeside Lab is about ecology and sustainability. And so if you triangulate those three things, the work that I do situates itself somewhere in the, in the middle of all that. So as a little bit of an introduction to the Iowa Lakeside Lab, uh, Lakeside Lab is a biological field research station in northwest Iowa. Um, it was founded on the premise of studying nature in nature. And so uh, it's a large property on West Okoboji Lake, but also surrounding it in the region are a number of prairie preserves, uh, restored prairies, wetlands, things like this. So it's a really rich, dynamic environment with a lot of opportunity for study and for engagement. And so at the Iowa Lakeside Lab, I teach a course called Acoustic Ecology, or recently renamed to uh, Interacting with Nature Sound. So Acoustic Ecology, for anybody who isn't familiar with the term, is the study of the relationship between people and their soundscape. And at Lakeside Lab, this is specifically focused on the relationship between nature sound and what nature sound can mean and signify within a variety of different environments. So the course itself is really about starting with this premise of active listening or deep listening. Uh, it really builds heavily on the work of, of Pauline Oliveris, uh, along with other folks like R. Marie Schaefer, Barry Truex, Eric Leonardson, uh, Bernie Krauss, and so on. So this idea of active listening uh, requires slowing down. So we always start out by slowing down, focusing on our ears, doing a variety of ear cleaning exercises, and then also interpreting what we're experiencing and what we're observing. And part of why this is so important is because this class is truly interdisciplinary. It draws on students from the arts and the sciences, and we go out in the field. We also meet up with artists, and we meet up with scientists who are working in different areas as we go. A portion of the class is about gear. This is the way that we record stuff, and it's it's sort of interesting and fun to talk about gear, but that's not the focus of the course. It's just a tool, a series of tools that we utilize as we uh, engage with these different environments. So everything from um, recording equipment where you need to be there, things that you leave that record over long periods of time, and then also like underwater recording equipment. But the focus is really about investigating these spaces through listening and allowing everyone to bring their own disciplinary interests to this act of listening as we engage with the soundscape. One of the first ways that we do that is by doing slow, focused walks around the property and developing listening maps as a result. It gives us an opportunity to translate something abstract into something uh, that we can then have a discussion about. And Part of the interesting uh, aspect of the, the infrastructure of this course is that as a course, we have a van and we have this van for two weeks. It's a very intensive course. Uh, it's two weeks, Monday through Friday, uh, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. every day. Uh, and we have access to this van so that we can go out and really explore the things in the local environment. So we have different uh, native and restored prairies that we go to. We investigate the infrastructure relationships to these spaces. We also engage with wetland preserves where that shoreline is a little bit blurrier and you get uh, forest wildlife along with aquatic wildlife. And we also go uh, to some places that are uh, really quite interesting and, and represent different types of geomorphology. So looking at how the glaciers really impacted this, this landscape is important. And again, we meet up with scientists and we meet up with artists along the way. And when I say investigate, I really do mean investigate. I, I try to inspire students to be curious and engage with the place through the listening provided by the recording equipment. And as soon as you put these headphones on, you know that you're experiencing something different. We're also looking for for things that are unique to this place. So the idea of controlled burns in an area that has a lot of different prairie restoration provides a lot of value to that area. We're on a lake, so of course we want to know what the lake sounds like. We always engage with recording underwater at different times of day and different days within the course in order to experience different activity levels, sometimes from a dock. Sometimes we do it by taking the silent sport boats out, but the idea of getting the microphones under the water and really experiencing what the lake has to offer is, is part of that, part of that uh, investigation. And because I'm particularly interested in the dawn chorus, the, the moments of wildlife activity right as the sun is coming up and what that signifies for the health of an environment, we do spend a lot of time going out pre-dawn. So at this time of year, it's, a, it's getting the recording equipment set up between you know, 4.30, 4.45 a.m. We also have a couple of bigger adventures. So uh, last few years, we've gone out and done an overnight in the backcountry of the Badlands in order to record and experience what it is uh, to be uh, in that type of uh, an environment, but also asking questions about uh, what the relationship of that environment is to the history, to the history of different peoples, and to the history of the national park in general. So camping out in the backcountry and getting those microphones set up and running overnight has been a really valuable part of that experience. 
And we look for opportunities too. Uh, one year we teamed up with uh, um, a, uh, a, a raptor sanctuary in order to use acoustic ecology to help tell their story and share their narrative. And it's about being curious. So I'm always looking for different ways of engaging the students. So here uh, I taught the class how to solder and everybody built their own contact microphones out of some really like basic affordable equipment. The students also engage with site analysis. So over the course of two weeks, they choose a location and they return to it multiple times. They use this worksheet that I've created in order to integrate the terminology that we're using in order to root it in the theory, but also the technology. And then again, engage with this idea of interpreting uh, what they're hearing visually, as well as using it as an opportunity to organize what it is they're collecting. Because a part of this is about storytelling. It's about science and communication. It's about finding meaning and being able to communicate it. And one way that we do that is through development of projects, some of which are shared out as part of a podcast, uh, which is called Interacting with Sound. And you can see here, students have engaged with topics that are specific to their interests and then developed these uh, short form narratives out of that result. So much like uh, many other people have referenced throughout this conference uh, for 2020 everything kind of went on pause but I made the decision to teach this course virtually which was also really fascinating so after promoting it and taking advantage of the fact that like the point of this course is in many ways to try to get away from people um, that that benefited everyone's interest in social distancing and so we held the class virtually which meant that people from all over the country located in different types of environments could take the course and I was able to uh, update and adjust the assignments, the prompts, and the readings in order to allow everyone to engage their own environment, which really facilitated these fascinating discussions as we brought different areas together. So I found it really intriguing that through the discussion, through the readings, through the theory, through the assignments, this course that had been developed for one particular location was able to map to all these different locations and still provide a similar type of value. And so I'm really excited for the possibility that this has moving forward. I just want to use my last minute or so to promote a couple of things. So at the Iowa Lakeside Lab, uh, along with teaching the uh, Acoustic Ecology or Nature Sound course, I'm also the director of the Iowa Lakeside Lab Artisan Residence Program. This is a residency that is focused on art that operates at the intersection of art, science, and nature. Um, and so if you want to learn more about this, the website is lakesidelabair.org and our Instagram is lakesidelabair. It's a competitive application process every year. Um, you can learn more about the type of work that the artists do. You can learn more about the artists who have been there. Uh, and every year we have a series of public events in the summer. Um, and so if you happen to be within the area, um, you can follow our social media accounts to learn more about when these events are happening. They are open to the public and they engage everybody on and off campus. A couple other things real quick. Uh, today is Friday, tomorrow, Saturday, July 18th is uh, 2020 World Listening Day. Uh, and the theme for this is the collective field. So whatever you're doing tomorrow, I would encourage you to spend a few minutes, just focus on your ears, focus on your soundscape. Think about what it means, especially given these tumultuous times to listen and to engage with not only your environment, but other people who are around you. Uh, and then the last thing that I wanted to promote, if you're interested in this kind of work, is the Midwest Society for Acoustic Ecology. I'm on the board of directors. It's a really engaged board with some really interesting programming that happens throughout the year all around the Midwest. So if you're interested in that, if you have any questions, you can hit me up or you can uh, follow the social media accounts related to that as well. So with that, I want to thank you very much for listening. Uh, I really am truly honored for this opportunity. Uh, and again, if you want to learn more about my work, you can find me at listeninginstruments.com or on Instagram as Listening Instruments. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was fantastic, Alex. Um, next, we have Julie Usha Libersat, pronouns she, her, who will be presenting Rome, Getting Lost in Art and Art Education. Thank you, Ellen. Um, and thank all of the folks at MCAD that have worked um, to put this together, um, especially with all of the changes and rescheduling. Um, I also just want to thank um, all of the previous presenters over the last four days. The dialogue has been really rich and timely. Um, I'd also like to follow in line with Ellen's um, model and situate myself 
on native land of the Wichita and Kickapoo tribes. Um, I'm currently an artist and educator based in North Texas. Um, as an artist and educator, I use a place-based approach in my art practice and apply this to my pedagogical practice. Centering place as an artist is, is rooted in my own upbringing and relationship to place. I was born in Kerala, India and moved to the U.S. when I was four. I returned to India as an adult and lived in Kerala again for eight years where I taught art at an English medium school. My own complex relationship with locating myself has been a lifelong inquiry into questions of home, belonging, and more recently to think about how we navigate place and the built environment and the ways that technology mediates our experiences moving through space. More often than not, my own art practice represents the disorientation and displacement that the modern American landscape produces within me. As more and more locations appear similar, our sense of place and belonging is increasingly more confusing and complex to understand. What I will focus on in today's presentation is an ongoing project titled Rome that I started in 2015. Um, I started this project during graduate school at University of North Texas, where I was pursuing uh, congruent degrees in MFA in New Media, as well as a master's in art education. Um, Rome was an endeavor on my part to unite my art practice and art education and pedagogical research. Um, so it, as such, has a parallel sort of um, kind of directions that it has taken, but have also continued to inform and enrich each other. So um, Rome is a project that was awarded the 2015 CAD fund, uh, which kind of possibly uh, sort of made everything a little bit more urgent um, and prescient as a project. Um, and then, so it afforded me the opportunity to also engage in really rich research with my mentor at University of North Texas, Edetti Perez Emiles, and our um, co-authored paper, Rome, Walking, Mapping and Play, Wanderings in Art and Art Education, was published in the study, Studies in Art Education. So I think the kind of, ability um, that this project afforded me was to do a sort of uh, speculative design endeavor and um, kind of engage with conceptual ideas as well. So Rome was a proposal uh, for the Contemporary Art Dealers of Dallas CAD Fund um, for an interactive urban exploration and mapping game for smartphones that helps players get lost. So players use the app to document their journey and it provides multimodal documentation like photo, video, audio, and written capture. So for me as an artist, I was engaged in creating a tool that uses disorientation as part of the artistic process to prompt aesthetic engagement and to think critically about our space and how and who can move within um, different places in our urban landscapes and suburban landscapes. So um, the uh, kind of overall idea for gameplay was a uh, timed play that, that traded a directive and a capture prompt. So players would be um, instructed to turn, look for something red, take a picture of it, and um, then describe it in three words. So I think for me, this became a really interesting entry into um, learning how to uh, design an app, um, especially being awarded money to create this. Um, I think what was a really rich intersection for me was that I was also going through a, a, a sort of pedagogical process or like a learning experience where I was um, orienting myself to kind of designing an interface for others. So I think part of this uh, process has been allowed me to think about what are the necessary tools um, beyond design and especially kind of borrowing from ideas of agile and lean development, how um, we want to fail early and fail often, and also, you know, how to 
create the minimum viable products. So I think one of the richest areas of this project for me were um, some of the kind of extensions that I produced. And so being limited in terms of a budget as well as um, my own ability to uh, code an app, I came, became interested in sort of simpler ideas of um, facilitating gameplay and disorientation, and also how um, different language, the languages of navigation, and even units of measure or units of time um, that, that sort of are culturally influencing how we move through space. So part of um, sort of developing this game became an interesting um, kind of experiment in also getting to um, have users play and um, sort of work through challenges to access um, sort of ways that my intention might um, sort of conflict with what I'm able to facilitate through technology or without technology. So um, I had the opportunity to share Rome in a couple of um, different workshop settings. I um, attended Mapping Meaning, which is a uh, convening, um, a yearly convening for artists, scientists, and researchers. Um, and it usually takes place in a national park field station. So we had the opportunity to be on the Channel Islands National Park. And um, I facilitated a, a kind of Rome activity where participants made walking books and were in a similar structure to Rome, prompted to um, alternate a direction, a navigation prompt and a capture prompt, and also to think about different kinds of um, perception in terms of ways that we map space. And so to think of, um, to play with language as well as the um, sort of requests that were being made of each other. So um, the way that I structured it was everyone had a book and um, entered one prompt and then passed it to the left. So by the end, everyone had a book that was um, produced by the entire group. And so we went out into the um, landscape and played. And I think some of the really interesting feedback for me was thinking about facilitating an engagement in a different landscape um, outside of a city and also what some of the prompts and the creative engagement and feedback that I got from the players in terms of uh, the way the things that they asked of each other. So um, a lot of them became more um, focused on, you know, using um, collecting samples like putting water in the dirt and putting it on the paper or um, describing what you taste. So I've I really enjoyed the richness in kind of what the creativity that comes out of hosting these events. Um, I also had a chance to share Rome at Paseo Taos in 2016. Paseo is a um, outdoor new media festival that takes place over a few days, and um, Rome was available for visitors to use to sort of get lost within the festival and take pictures. Um, I also, through this opportunity, got to share Rome as a workshop with um, Taos Cyber Magnet School. And so this was a group of teens that um, are in a sort of distance education situation. And so with this format, I had, um, I introduced the students to a lot of spatial theory and research and sort of ideas um, of introducing play and games into art making. And then I had them create their own card games, uh, also collaboratively, and also play with mine, give, give feedback within um, all of the activities, and then play with the digital version of Roma as well. So um, I think a lot of the opportunities to share, share um, whatever iteration that Rome is in at the time that I'm facilitating, um, has sort of really informed my process. So I, I also was able to share Rome um, as an artist in residence at the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth um, in the Teen Artist Project. So the Teen Artist Project is a year-long engagement for teens that sign up to 
go to the museum every Sunday for three hours. And the museum um, hosts several art artists and residents who um, work with them for a month for three to four consecutive Sundays. And so I had over three days a chance to interact with these kids and sort of ask questions about the museum as a site and place and kind of getting lost within the museum. Um, what kind of ways could we be critical, playful, um, and also what are the ways that we might map that space differently? So um, I think a lot of the really exciting outcomes of this were just the ways that the students' bodies were occupying the space uh, creatively and disruptively sometimes. Um, there was a beautiful moment where a student started singing inside of a Richard Serra sculpture that has this amazing acoustics. Um, and I think also the students um, were interesting in, the, in their um, questions about the institution as well. So in considering how we might use mapping as an institutional critique. So on the left, we've got a picture of the students at the board, um, the board table uh, in, the, in the sort of VIP section of the museum. We also got this view under the lake um, that you saw in the previous images and the sort of um, off limits areas of the museum. Um, I think for um, to contextualize this work in the present moment, and I've been redeveloping a new digital iteration of Rome, um, I think it's it's been very interesting to consider the ways that we have seen space occupied within the last um, two months. And I think, for me, a lot of the the um, kind of this work returns to thinking about the social aspects of spatial practices and the ways that space um, is determining many of our relationships, ways of moving and, and access and privilege. Um, and so just to end, um, if you'd like to play Rome, the link is game.romegetlost.com and more information about the project, romegetlost.com. And thank you so much, Ellen. Thank you, Julie. That was great. Um, next, we have Diani Whitehawk, she, her pronouns, who will be presenting Listen, a video installation focused on indigenous language, people, and place. Hi, everybody. Um, I think Chloe was going to put a survey up for us real quickly. Um, so just take a 30 seconds or less to think this through, submit your answers, and then we'll carry, carry forward. How are we doing, Chloe? We've got about 80%. Should I close it? Go ahead and submit if you haven't yet, everybody. There won't be a quiz at the end, I promise. And yeah, you can go ahead and close it now. <clears throat> Would you like me to share the results up on the screen? Um, let's, let's do that. We can yeah, do it later. Yeah, yeah, let's, yeah, I'd like to see it, just out of curiosity. Zero, 63%, one to two, 25, All right, good to know. Yeah, keep that in mind as, as we go through. Thank you, Chloe. <clears throat> All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Diani Whitehawk. Um, I'm a visual artist. Um, with a studio practice based in Minneapolis. Um, my studio practice is, is rooted primarily in abstract painting. Um, I combine through mediums, practices, motifs, and histories, modern abstract easel painting 
and Lakota artistic practices such as beadwork and porcupine quill work. Um, although I'm not formally a teacher uh, in the sense that I'm not employed as such, my work is very much rooted in efforts to create opportunities for uh, education and communal growth. Uh, I create work from my perspective as a woman of mixed indigenous and non-indigenous uh, lineage. I'm Sichangu Lakota through my mom and German and Welsh American through my dad. Um, and I create work that expresses the many ways that my biology has shaped my life experiences and worldview. Uh, I create works that are meant to honor and celebrate the contributions of Native peoples to our local, national, and global histories, as well as our artistic histories. Through this, the work urges audience members to think critically about the ways our histories have been told and stress the necessity to shift towards honest, inclusive, diverse, diverse and just telling of our local, national, global, and by extension, artistic histories. So considering this conference is on the topic of teaching place, uh, it made me think about the recent practice of land acknowledgments in arts and academia as a part of the field's efforts towards increased diversity, inclusion, and equity. So I was glad to see that um, MCAD included theirs and their last presenter included it in her presentation as well. Um, land acknowledgments are a really important development as they've prompted a national sense of responsibility to think about, acknowledge, and consider the history of the land upon which an institution sits. But I encourage and uh, urge folks to see these as building blocks upon which to build. They cannot be a single gesture or statement that is drafted and recited at public events or a placard created and placed on a building wall and then the work is done. It must be a document that sig signals a commitment to ongoing and active work. If a land acknowledgement does not shift the way an institution or an organization is doing their work, if it is not partnered with a culture that guides the institution or organization and work that is committed to dismantling the white and male supremacist structures that our institutions have been molded to uphold, then it's simply wallpaper inexpensively slapped on to change the appearance, but not actually changing the structure to adapt to the current environment and necessity to actively work towards honest, inclusive, diversive, diversive, and just educational environments. Diverse, I said diversive. My six-year-old's hollering at me in the background. Um, we must see changes that regularly and forever change to hire, exhibit, support Black, Indigenous, people of color, women, and LGBTQ and Two-Spirit relatives. Not as others, not as tokens, but as regularly equally valid con contributors to our arts, education, our syllabus, and every other aspect of our lives and stories. <laughs> this is oh, too sweatshirt. Ah! Since we're working at home, y'all, this is the reality. <laughs> Say hi. Um, Mom. No, not right now. Um, so the work I'm going to share tonight is a piece um, not that I didn't make with land acknowledgments in mind, um, but it's certainly related, and it can be seen as its own kind of active, embodied land acknowledgment. Um, Listen is the title of a video installation that's currently installed at the Plains Museum. Um, it consists of eight yeah. monitors that are um, that are hung on two adjacent walls, spaced apart with eight separate videos playing simultaneously. Um, and on the monitors, the videos are um, about five minutes long that are looping, and they are of eight individual women um, who are speaking uh, Dakota, Ojibwe, Ho-Chunk, Seneca, Dene, Kokopa, Quitsan, and Tiwa. Um, the footage is shot 
on the indigenous lands of each woman and the language that is associated with that land base. Um, the video that we're going to watch in just a moment here is of um, Rose Marie Lujan, who is Tiwa from Taos Pueblo. Um, okay. Um, and so we're going to watch that. And then after we watch that, I'm going to read the exhibition statement for you. And um, we'll go from there. So Chloe, if you could play the video. Hi <laughs> In a cell, I keep I will want that tea. He ain't too limit not be what I know. Um, you name your I thank him all so by a man e we and I in cell. I he you not keep I will want in a walk we in a walk. I it's here. I am a man, but it it all a man, but I in a cell. I mean, a walk. I want to put on a winner on guy. Yet I eat tight a man, leave or not, and oh, are you dirty too in Iwam? Your name he, Imaume in Biu, not Bamay. I cannot tap on bo. You will be my men bo, Iwamaume, we are in a sign we key up, Biwi. Boy, step on your bill, not a guy hot, we are in a bassay on me in a walk. โอ้นาทีนี้อีวอดออลแมนนาอีวิดออลแมนปมอีออไอตันอีวากอยเนอไอปินาปุยปาโฮวีเอนาอีดออลแมนกินอเปยไอนาอีวิดโลฟายามก
no i uwa ki na ui mō mapo i na mō yaki ai. Ia ai tenta ti i uwa i na ui. Bina kōm ho, i na hi a i hi an bō ana hi tamak ai kūhi i tū mē ho. Ha bō ki ui a wa i. Ai ui a na i pi a ma i na wa m tū i ha bō nā ki tū i na ui. U un pina pawe ai na wam. Na yu na kit ai we wa e hili yo ho, na wa hui ha pa yo ho. Den da o at at men hili an a tu we ai na wa wa. Pa yo ho na we na tu pu tu o o we tat koi an a ta ho na hui. U un an a e ya e. Ai yu i tu men pa ha pa u un an imat a a we an men pa. Ai yu na we an a kit. Kuya walita a yutiu ina wihi hom yut no papa kina tusa ina pa mahalo i na si watak ay ina he amohi an kay kani ina wahe amin na sul palo kay huwa ta ay yut ay wia na kwa i i wahe amen ha pa kwa na pa amen pa sa yai kia piho. Um, so, at the exhibition, um, there's a number of, of paintings and uh, mixed media beadwork and um, painted work and sculptural work, um, along with a photo installation and this video installation. Um, as I mentioned, the videos are, are on loop and playing, and so they collectively fill the sound with uh, indigenous language and the sounds of the land from uh, which that language is from, um, specifically tied to an individual. Um, to a woman to today. And um, so it fills the space, but they're spaced out in a way that you can stand in front of a single um, uh, monitor and uh, you're able to listen solely to that um, speaker. And so I'm going to read to you the um, exhibition statement that accompanies the installation. Listen. How many languages can you identify by sound? <clears throat> French, German, Russian, Spanish, Chinese, Japanese, Hindi, Italian, Swedish, Irish, Hmong, Somali, Dutch, Portuguese, Vietnamese, Arabic, etc. The average American adult can likely identify simply by sound upwards of 10 to 20 languages. The majority of those languages, including English, are not from this land. Conversely, the majority of Americans are likely not able to identify by sound more than one or two, if any, of the languages from this land. Due to the forces of colonization, this reality has likely never even crossed the minds of most. Can you identify by sound Dakota, Ojibwe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Diné, Tiwa, Quetzan, Cocopa, Seneca, Comanche, Kiowa, Cherokee, Yupik, Keres, etc. According to the Indigenous Language Institute, there were once more than 300 indigenous languages spoken in the United States, and approximately 175 remain today. They also estimate that without restoration efforts, there will be at most 20 still spoken in 2050. Listen aims to chip away at one of the biggest challenges facing Native people, the tremendous lack of knowledge among the American public regarding Native people, history, and our contemporary tribal nations. Because the full national history of this land is not taught in our public education systems, most Americans are largely oblivious to the history and contemporary realities of Native people. Listen is a video installation created for museum and gallery spaces with eight to upwards of 20 monitors as the project grows. 
and each monitor footage of the land and environment is behind and layered over the body of a native woman indigenous to that region. Each woman speaks for the duration of the video in her indigenous language. Some speak about their experiences in boarding school when they were forced to abandon speaking their native languages. Others share prayers, stories of their relationship to the land, tribal and personal stories. The aim is not for you to be able to understand or translate what they are sharing, but simply to be introduced to and familiarized with the cadence and sounds of a small sampling of the indigenous languages of this land. Listen provides a window into the immense division between the greater American public and our indigenous nations, as well as the tremendous omissions of truth in how our national history is taught. Um, so that wraps up uh, my sharing. I just wanted to share with you all um, uh, a recent work that is is not about you know how to necessarily teach uh, place in our classrooms, but that is uh, actively encouraging people to think about how we uh, address, uh, tell the stories of, um, educate around and acknowledge place uh, in our teaching and in our everyday lives. Thank you so much, Diani. That was fantastic. Um, next, we're going to ask all of our panelists to uh, turn on your cameras and we'll um, go into sort of a panel style Q&A. And I've got some questions here. Feel free for our, our attendees. If you have more questions, go ahead and enter them here. I've got about five right now. So um, if, if you want to enter more, go for it. I'll start off with the top here. Um, this is a question for Leslie. And it asks, could we ask uh, Leslie to share the literary resources that she referenced? Um, and so I don't know if you're able to, Leslie, but if you wanted to maybe drop those into the shared uh, crowdsource reading list for the conference, yes. that would yes, be amazing. I'd be happy to. And I also have, um, I can put in all the sound artists that we talk about with that assignment. I didn't really think I had time to go into that, but I can put that resource in there too. I'm sure a lot of people will enjoy that. So thank you. All right, I have a question here for Robert. Did the students from the two schools have contact with each other during the learning uh -huh. process? And would you talk about why or why not that that happened? Well, they did not actually. Um, can't hear me. Sorry. Thank you. Oh, no, I can hear you. <laughs> you can hear me. OK. Yes. Sorry. They did not have contact. And that's actually would have been a really fantastic idea that I have to admit we just didn't think of. But I think also maybe in thinking about this further, I mean, um, we were really invested in and this is why this seemed relevant to me to talk about in terms of place. We were really invested in the time and place in that moment. And um, I mentioned at the end of my presentation that I didn't, we hadn't really thought of it about place in the, in the time we were doing it. But in retrospect, we were very much about that. And I think that we did not include all those other students cross continentally. Um, largely because we were so focused on what happened in that space in that time right then and it would have it, it was it was it was a weird it was a weird construct in the sense that it's in a gallery but it's also um a thing happening in real time and space um and by this group of people which was you know 15 to 20. um so i think we were we didn't do that and didn't even think about it, probably because we were just focused, conceiving the whole thing as related to just that spot. Got it. Thank you. All right. Um, I have a question for Alex. Do you offer classes or instruct in graphic design classes in relation to the acoustic work? And do you expose the intersectionality of your practices to your students and how? Uh, yes. So uh, I do teach. Um, sound and sound focused classes in the graphic design program which is really interesting um, and within my own work because i sort of trained as a graphic designer first 
um, who was also working with sound in an interactive and, and time-based environment, um, it, the sound was kind of always part of my professional practice. And so then as I sort of transitioned to being uh, much more of an educator and working more with sound, I, I can't leave the graphic design part behind. So I'm always looking for ways to design booklets and worksheets and activities, things to go along with exhibitions. All, all the exhibitions end up having a graphic form in some way. I, I always try to design all the, the methods of, of display and things like that. And so then I do uh, work really hard to try to expose my students to that. I'm also very fortunate and then I get to work with graduate students. Um, and so sometimes those graduate students will uh, help me with uh, projects, but other times they've chosen to work with me because I have a practice that, that they would like to model after. And so that that process then very much becomes um, a, a two way. And, and as an educator, that that alone is one of my, my favorite things, especially in these interdisciplinary spaces where, where I come away learning, you know, tons of stuff uh, along with. Absolutely. And then just a not so much a question as a comment, someone asked um, that they would also appreciate your reading list that you reference during the during the presentation. So if you wanted to add that to the crowdsource list, I think a lot of people will be interested. So. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, cool. Great. Um, I have a question for Julie. Um, this is I love the ways in which you transform Rome from cards to books to an app for the phone, um, for the places in which you will use it. You mentioned you don't have much experience in game design. How on earth were you able to get funding to develop a game when it is a medium you did not have much experience in? How did you know this was the right thing to create and the right medium to create it in? <laughs> That's a good question. And it is part of the story of the project. Um, the grant that I got for the project, some of the slides that I showed you, I used in a pitch, which was in a format of like a Sunday supper um, fundraiser. So everyone that bought soup, their ticket uh, went towards this grant. And so the outcome of sort of pitching an idea um, like that, and then, you know, the, the number of votes gets the funding was very, you know, sort of strange and um, I w wasn't really prepared to get all together to create it, but it, as an artist, I just sort of, um, I had to also think about like getting lost myself within the pro within that process. I tried to honor that throughout, but, um, I, that's why the simplicity of the digital, uh, sort of product, uh, really was a, a process of like refining that concept. So it became a, sort of just random random word generator, a random number generator for like how many steps you might walk and then afforded this opportunity to think of making the game like a worksheet that in the workshops, the students could input some of those words. And so that then it's also a tool that you're like playing with language and how lots of different people uh, differ in the way that they think that they conceptualize and verbalize space and navigation. Um, but it, it is, it has been an ongoing thing. And so since it has been a very long process, like five years, I have sort of grown up um, throughout and learned a lot. And then also, um, I think I, I've started kind of identifying it that it's called instructional design, right? And it is the way that you can unite uh, <laughs> this idea of interfaces just for interaction um, and game design is very uh, appropriate, I think, in some circumstances. <laughs> That's great, thank you. All right, I have a question for Diani. Uh, first, a comment, Listen is such a beautiful project. Is it possible to see any still images or watch the other videos from the installation? Not yet. Um, unless you traveled to Fargo, <laughs> sorry. Thank you, I'm glad that um, that you enjoyed what I shared with you guys tonight. Um, I don't have a uh, online um, public platform for viewing the, the work yet. Uh, the display of this work at the exhibition at the Plains Museum is the first iteration of this, um, of the installation. And I hope it's the first of, of many. I hope to continue to um, raise funds to continue to do the filming, to travel and, and do the filming. Um, 
I mentioned that there's eight now. I would like to see this to be upwards of 20. I would eventually like to see it um, displayed here in the Twin Cities and in other spaces. Um, it may be uh, in the southern part of the states in the beginning of next year. Um, <clears throat> but I don't have um, a way for folks to, to get into all of them now. So I'm glad you got a little sample tonight. I'm sorry, I wish I could give you more. And at some point, you know, um, I guess I would say maybe check back on my website from time to time, which is just my name.com, Um, But I'll have to figure out what it means to to create this immersive gallery experience, which is really what it's supposed to be, is to, to kind of flood and immerse people in um, the sounds of indigenous language and to stand person to person um, in front of that, you know, as as much as you can be video monitor to person, but to stand in front of, of that space and to um, have a have that experience as opposed to, you know, sharing it uh, on a, a computer monitor, mm -hmm. which is good too. But um, I, I'll have to keep thinking about, you know, how I want to uh, spread and share that uh, beyond gallery spaces. But thank you for the ask. Excellent. Thank you. All right. I have a question now for Reagan. Can you speak more to the process in which students synthesize their experiences into a collaborative installation? What uh, what challenges or expected or unexpected hurdles did you encounter as a teacher facilitating the process? Mm, great question. Um, I think that the process was uh, a little bit um, awkward challenging messy there was no kind of like we quickly arrived at the solution to this um there was a lot of negotiation they had about a week and a half to figure out what their installation would be so i did keep it a pretty condensed time period um, to keep them kind of motivated and thinking through ideas i also had them do some readings about the white cube and rethinking that space um, particularly david bachelor's chromophobia um, as a way of kind of getting them started thinking about how to approach that space critically with color, because it was a class about color theory. Um, and I think that they, through the negotiation process, worked out designs that, you know, there were some people were always a little upset or <laughs> not 100% not pleased, but um, overall, I think they were really satisfied when they could move through the space and feel like they were walking into one of their drawings. And it was um, really transformed their later projects that followed it and how they thought about drawing and painting as this kind of more expansive um, material. So it was, it was a kind of, you know, through hashing it out, and some of the unexpected things were the found objects that they brought into the um, space. And um, where they found those, a lot of them they found you know on the neighborhood on the curb um, on the free shelf at school they were kind of became you know collectors also for a week so they would bring in this pile of objects that then they would paint different colors and they had a it was it kind of also got them out into the neighborhood to like of collecting things and harvesting things for their installation, which were then returned to the free shelf painted and reused in other projects at MCAD. The uh, free shelf functions as this kind of endless cycle of objects that um, people take and reuse and put back and things like that. So um, they had a great experience, I think, doing that as well. So it was, um, it was a little bit of a risk, you know, they, they have a lot of freedom in this project to create the installation and to alter the spaces, um, but they all did it really responsibly and thoughtfully. And every semester, I'm amazed when I walk into these spaces. It's just really glorious. Great, excellent. Um, next, I've got a question for Alex. When you're working with students at the field station, are your students traveling from geographically diverse places or are they all fairly local? And how do you recruit people um, to this? Uh, yeah, so they they have come from all over the US um, and it's different for different classes. Um, you know, for the, for the class that I teach, most of the students have been from the, you know, sort of from Iowa or, or from the Midwest, um, but not exclusively. 
Um, and then, yeah, I, I, I promote it through um, social media and there's a couple of different um, you know, email lists that the things uh, get sent out through. And then there's a whole host of other courses at Lakeside Lab in the summer. Um, and so they have a whole promotional campaign. They put up posters around universities. Um, the way the lab works is it's actually run by the Iowa Board of Regents. So University of Iowa, Iowa State, and University of Northern Iowa all kind of have a stake and a presence at the facility. Um, and so there's uh, all the sort of various um, uh, PR networks associated with the different schools, mostly in the sciences. That's great, thank you. Um, Diani, I have another question for you. Uh, this person states, I'm so happy to hear the critique of land acknowledgement as mere wallpaper. I also was really appreciated that. As much as I want people to acknowledge the histories of native people, I find myself often questioning the motives of colleagues because I see little commitment to indigenous knowledges. What are your recommendations to be affirmative, but at the same time call into question tokenism? I think for me, thank you for that question, whoever asked the question, I appreciate it. Um, for me, I think the best practice has just been uh, a, a really strong balance of compassion and honesty. Um, so compassion for the fact that, you know, our reality is our reality today, you know, and, and we have to start somewhere and that everybody can't know everything and everybody can't be expected to be in the same place of development or education or learning or understanding simultaneously. Um, we, we don't know what that looks like. <laughs> um, but we can be uh, honest and um, good to one another in that honesty. Not everybody is able, has the capacity to take honesty um, in the way that uh, is, is, I guess, the most productive and, and healthy and, you know, um, a, a way to move forward. But if we combine those things, you know, compassion and honesty, you know, I'm compassionate about your humanity and, and you know, who you are. And so I'm going to communicate this with respect. But the reality is a mm -hmm. land acknowledgement cannot be just a land acknowledgement or it really is just wallpaper. It really it does just become a gesture that's like, OK, we did this thing. Now we, you know, wash our hands of it. We've done the work. You know, we brought somebody in here. We made the acknowledgement. And now we move on and we keep doing things the way we do. Them. Mm -hmm. That's that's not. That's not growth. That's um, that's a gesture and it's uh, a cover up in a lot of ways, I think, or it, it can serve to be one. So mm -hmm. if we can acknowledge, hey, that's a really. Awesome, great, wonderful starting point now. Let's use that as a building block. How do we build on that to reflect that in our work? We have to be reflecting that in our work all the time, not once a year, not during Native Heritage Month, not during you know any of that. But in and how do we change the culture of the work in the organization, in the institution, in our personal lives, in our personal work, at our dinner tables that uses the land acknowledgement as a starting point of thinking of of placing um the history of this land as a way to acknowledge how the history shapes our present and start telling those stories in a more holistic open honest manner so that we can use those lessons to grow towards um you know the goals that that we that we know are ne necessary for peace you know the 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 goals that we know are necessary for justice we can't just paint a pretty picture on the outside and pretend the work is is has been done or is being done um so i really think you just we have to be honest about that and be willing to talk about it and it doesn't necessarily have to be a teardown or attack it can be like this is, you know, we put ourselves in danger if we just say this thing, but we don't back it up with work. And we don't back it up with work all the time, from here on out forevermore, you know? And mm -hmm. so that's my suggestion, but I think that those kinds of truth telling and honesty and, and pushing towards models that constantly do that work um, can be done in a way that's, that's um, compassionate and acknowledges 
our humanity and our errors and that errors are really an opportunity for growth. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next, I've got a question for Leslie. Um, do you have a publication of your research presentation? And if so, um, this person would love to read it. So I don't know if you have that out there. Um, you mean of what I just talked about or mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the I don't I understand think, the question. I think so. It's um, do you have a publication on your research presentation? So I don't know if you have anything out there. This is no nope. <laughs> brand new debuting at this conference. So. I mean, it's an assignment that my students have heard about. <laughs> That's great. Um, but I can um, I can add more uh, like some of the information to the um, document, the shared document. Sounds good. And try and put as much in there as possible, I guess. <laughs> oh, I'm getting comments in the in the oh, question okay. box that say, um, "Yes, hurry up and write it, Leslie." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. You've got a fan in the comments there. <laughs> oh, nice. Thank you. I appreciate that. Absolutely. I'd love to hear from anyone their responses to my students' piece. If anyone feels they they have a response. Mm -hmm. Pardon. Um, I, uh, thank you, Leslie. That's fantastic. Oh, yeah. um, all right. Next, I have a question for Julie. Um, we've got the idea of encouraging people to get lost through technology is so great. How might the residual experience of acti actively getting lost encourage a different kind of approach to other areas of study or life? Great question. Um, well, I think for me in this project, uh, coming up against technology um, as something that would be between you and an interaction, and that tool uh, um, for me was uh, sort of a tension that I was, I was struggling with, and I think in some ways why I gravitated towards the books and the cards, um, that I think, you know, especially seeing Pokemon Go kind of transformed the way people were moving in space. It was fascinating, but it was also sort of, you know, still requiring your phone to enter into an engagement of observa creative observation. Um, but I do think that um, the, the sort of engagement with getting lost through technology is, is sort of rich because we have this dependence and weird relationship with navigating now. And also, like technology is kind of imaging, we're having perspectives on the world, right? And so, mapping itself is um, a kind of colonial practice. So, I think of like part of my uh, directions, I guess, to answer the question that it has gone to is to really think of like how could technology and future technologies like augmented reality and location based uh, mapping kind of platforms could tell a story and kind of map a space that could be collaboratively produced and really rich and sort of um, overlaid through multiple voices. So it seems utopian. I'm not sure if it's possible, but I think technology also fails a lot, right? <laughs> so um, that that I hope I think that answers the question. Got it. And I think you sort of naturally answered another question that was sitting here for you, which was, what is next for Rome? Um, mm -hmm. it, does that sort of encompass what you would like to answer for that as well? Um, sure. I mean, I think uh, it, the experience working on Rome is sort of preparing me for a new project that I'm collaborating on with a group of faculty at TWU to um, for an NEH grant to um, create a sort of curricular engagement and faculty development program to learn about the history of Quakertown, which is a park just adjacent to our campus that had been a Freedman community. And it was uh, dislocated, forcibly removed in 1921. And TW was really uh, intertwined in that re rationale and history. So, um, you know, it's sort of like a commitment to have faculty do like arts-based place-based research across curriculums. and. Uh, one of my collaborators is a computer science professor, and so I think to also answer the previous question, I'm in a situation where kind of creating a digital platform like this requires a lot of people, and now I think that's a, a sort of 
outgrowth of just answering that question of how do you make a rich map of space, um, whether you're getting lost or not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Diani, I've got another question for you. Uh, do you hope the Listen series to encourage, or I think there's just a word missing there. Do you hope for the Listen series to encourage the creation of indigenous language dictionaries or documentation? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> my my goal, I guess I'll, I'll explain a little bit about the goal or the beginning of the work. Um, and yes, I mean, I guess I always hope for um, you know more active work for language continuity. Um, but I, that's not why I made the work. Uh, I, I made the work really asking the questions. You know, for for native artists, uh, one of the biggest hurdles is the fact that anytime you have a curatorial visit or um, maybe an exhibition opportunity or somebody, you know, just some opportunity for someone to see your work or you're hoping for some opportunity for someone to see or support your work, there's often a giant chasm of knowledge and understanding. And so we often are tasked with doing like an entire history lesson before <laughs> folks can understand what is embedded in the work and we can have the conversation about why that's important right now. Um, and it's a really hard, daunting task. Um, but that task is not exclusive to artists. That's something any Native person in any field is tasked with. Education, health, sciences, whatever you're working in, most folks don't know Native history. Most folks don't know how that history affects our lives today. Most folks, like so many, you know, almost every Native person you can ask has met someone who are like, oh my God, you're the first native person I've ever met. Or oh, I, you know, almost everybody has had the experience where somebody has even said, I thought you all were dead. I mean, though, that's the kind of like the, the gap of ignorance that we often deal with. And so to get somebody to like a curator who hasn't been active in, um, in learning about uh, indigenous art history or even art history outside of like the Western canon, um, it's it's just this huge obstacle. They can't read it. They can't unpack it. They can't like interpret it in the way that they can if people are responding to um, mainstream Western art movements, you know, or 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 mainstream like American culture or things that you know people can go, oh, ah, I see what's in there. I get it. I get it. I get it. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes um, there's just this this big roadblock. And so I was thinking about like. How do you even start to chip away at that? Um, how, how, how it's it feels impossible because we don't have control over um, the education system. We mm -hmm. just don't, you know. And so unless people are being taught, um, it feels like this impossible, daunting task. And so instead, of, I started thinking. I'm like, well, that feels impossible to chip away at that. Even you know, at my little bit of individual contribution, whatever I can do. But I thought, well, what if we could, could create an environment where folks could at least have an opportunity for a potential epiphany to realize that that chasm exists, like mm -hmm. a, a, a moment of epiphany for them to stand in the space and be like, oh, man, I didn't even know. I never even thought about that. I never even thought about the fact that I can't identify by sound any languages that are from here. Mm -hmm. That's absurd, right? And so if we can at least start like introducing, hey, 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 you know, like think about that and why that is and what does that mean and what are the implications behind that? And so that was the 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 uh, inspiration for the work. It's why I created the work. It's, you know, I'm hoping that it's um, a bridge builder, a moment of, of um, understanding of, how we've told our stories and you know a, a, a inspiration for folks to start thinking more critically about that and why we don't hear from certain voices why we're not taught certain histories why certain people aren't included in our national conversations absolutely we have a, a comment or suggestion from one of our attendees that says i see a future collaboration between diani and julie to make listen 
an app in landscapes where the native speakers live. <laughs> <laughs> that so sounds like fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, let's see, I've got a question here for Alex. If one wanted to begin as a beginner in a small scale to think about and engage with acoustic ecologies, what would be a good place to start? Uh, well, so I think so. I have sort of two minds about that answer. Um, one is to begin by looking into the work of R. Murray Schaefer and uh, Bernie Krauss, which uh, I will add those li links to the reading list. Uh, Bernie Krauss has a, an amazing TED talk that just like distills a bunch of fantastic information. Uh, and Armory Schaefer is a, a composer who really sort of, um, you know, started the work uh, that this is all built upon and, and, and wrote a book that uh, it, it still sort of sits at the beginning. So that, that gives you a really good base of like the theory that some of this begins with. Uh, but then in terms of going out and doing it, the, the thing is to just go out and, and do it. Um, don't, don't get hung up on like expensive recording equipment, um, you know, I'm, I'm a firm believer in the phrase like the best sound recorder is the one that you have on you. So you can have all the fancy equipment in the world, but if you don't have it with you, it's not going to do you any good. So like get a free app, use the voice memo app, figure out how to get it copied to your computer, get uh, Audacity, which is a free audio editing program. You can start opening the files. You can start re-listening to the things that you're capturing. A couple hundred dollars, you can get a great entry level like Zoom handy recorder. Um, you know, so and then it just goes on and on and on. But don't get hung up by the gear. It really is much more about the practice and the active engagement in different types of environments and, and taking the time to pause and listen. Um, and that's just something else I kind of want to underscore is that it really is about the time. Um, you know, when, when you're talking about video and imagery, video has such a thing as a still frame. You pause a video, you have an image. There's no such thing as a still frame when it comes to sound. Time is inherently required for sound to happen. And so, if you're pursuing a particular type of sound or if you're experiencing sound, like you have to be comfortable giving it that time. Um, and that's where the, the sort of deep listening practice comes in. But yeah, I just go out and do it. That's like step one. That's great. That's wonderful. Um, and there was a, a brief question just in general. People are asking, where is that shared reading list? And if you go in your navigation column over here, there's a thing for handout. If you download that handout, it has links to all the shared resources. So you can uh, download that and find it. Um, there was an important comment here that I skipped over at, at first because our conversation got rolling in a different direction. Um, but one of our attendees wanted to leap to explanation for, for Leslie. Um, she said, Leslie's work and pedagogy are incredible. Um, and Leslie is uh, a part-time faculty member. So she wanted to emphasize that time is of the essence. It is limited. And and labor is a real issue, and we need to acknowledge that. And I just wanted to verbalize that and send it out into our shared space tonight, that labor is real. Academia, academia has some very serious flaws. It's a very white supremacist um, system that has many, many problems we need to solve. Um, and I was glad somebody brought that up and, and just mentioned that uh, the labor that happens in academia is distributed uneven and unevenly, and it takes time. For, for some of us to get that that um, much sought after excellent research done. Um, so Leslie, again, kudos on that. Thank yeah. you, thank you, whoever you are. <laughs> I appreciate exactly. that. Exactly. <laughs> um, let's see here, I've got one more for uh, Julie. It's a quick one, um, or maybe not a quick one, but one we can have as our last question here. Did you consider ADA compliance with the fonts and colors you chose? And is this app bilingual or only in English or in other languages? Really great question. I mean, I think that um, I'm really interested in considering how this would work in different modalities, right? I um, My collaborator now is actually um, visually impaired and um, he's, a teacher, right? And so sort of collaborating with him is fascinating because of, you know, how we navigate technology differently as well. Um, but I think there's a couple of really amazing um, projects that I'm thinking of um, in terms of like, uh, I'm forgetting their name, but the kind of engaging with different senses and in, in walking. And um, the app is 
is super basic right now. And I think um, the goal would be all of these variations. And I think the, the question of how safety is a huge one, right? Because even who plays and wh whose body is in which space in playing this. And so those questions became very apparent to me and kind of as a tool to investigate an institution or within like a boundary has been a really interesting kind of also how we communicate about safety, right? Like symbols yeah. of safety. So um, hopefully to be continued. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm so inspired by our audience members tonight. So many great, great questions and comments. We got a couple more that came in, but we're right at the end. So I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, so thank you all so much. I want to recognize our wonderful panelists. Thank you all so much. Um, this was really fantastic. Um, this was the last evening of the conference. So thanks for sticking it out to the end. I know I've seen some of these attendees every night. It's really wonderful. Um, our follow-up now will be to um, send everybody links to these recordings. And so uh, be, be on the lookout in the next week or so. We should be able to um, download all of these, edit, add some stuff on the front and back end of each recording, and we will upload those to YouTube, and we will send out all four nights to everyone who registered, even for just one night. So you'll get access to all the good stuff. Um, so thank you all and have a beautiful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sure. this was great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. <laughs>